wave as uh, the aircraft comes back down the uh, flight line for those uh, pictures being taken today. taking what was Britain's first monoplane bomber into the skies. Now we've got some news just in. We have news just in. That nose piece is actually original and was found recently in the form of an electric car. So coming in now, the Anson and the Bennett. Made in flight 1935, designed by Frank Barnwell, 4,422. I think it was just the UK production. Crystal Blenheim. The Blenheim used extensively in the first couple of years of the Second World War. And his performance was outstanding. over there in particular at the American Lockheed Electra and used uh, some of the design elements of the Electra in his plans for the uh, Blenheim. Basically there were two nose designs uh, available on uh, the Blenheim. Largely obsolete, it has to be said, the aircraft by the outbreak of the Second World War. At the time, it was very much a case of it was because it was the aircraft that carried out the first Allied air attack on the Japanese carrier force in the Pacific War. Cruise speed of around about 172 knots, which is about 198 miles an hour, something like that, at 11,000 feet, and an operational range effectively of about 1,400 miles. Just to give you an idea, when it was still a light mail plane, the aircraft could fly over 300 miles an hour, but the added weight of military equipment brought it down to around 250.
project is still alive. Frank Barnwell, who designed the Blenheim, uh, didn't live to see that uh, all three of his sons died flying Blenheims in the early part of the war. Transport Command, uh, circa 1944, um, RAF Coningsby. A red tail Mustang just sneaking down to the uh, runway threshold to take off and go into a, a holding pack ahead of its display in a few minutes time. Once the uh, Mustang has departed in the 20s. Major Hargreaves, who flew it around Britain in connection with his army duty visiting firing ranges. So, in time, that would be the various other owners, including, as I mentioned, Nancy Dear, Bax, and Death. We heard all about her antics from her and his Sue who joined us up here on the boat in, uh, a little while ago. The BA Swallow. Uh, about 50 of them were produced over time. And two seats a tandem arrangement open cockpit. Very light wing loading is apparent in the uh, the way that it uh, just wobbles about a bit with the uh, the thermals and the it's still perfectly stable, but it just has to. Has to be said during those interwar years that the Germans were exceptional aviation designers and uh, engineers and uh, encouraging people to take up sports flying. Of course, uh, had military benefits for them come the outbreak of the Second World War. Of course, they weren't allowed powered flight to polysize to get the best. above Bedfordshire in a, an open cockpit plane, especially one so historic and unusual in the skies above England as the Clare. You probably notice the little hoofs under the wings. Um, they're there because the aircraft... Example of what I 
the same way that you would learn, you can learn here and there, perhaps not using the main roadway, but maximising the grass space available and uh, the current wind conditions. taxes in do please show your appreciation and also while we're waiting for David just another group to mention you'll see that when the uh, order somehow when you look at the Mustang you can see how a turbo prop engine on the front would actually work Second World War is quite phenomenal. The aircraft given that red tail for uh, recognition purposes. Some 15,000 years ago. And this is an original red tail aircraft. Uh, was it was a special. Built in Inglewood, California. It saw service in the latter part of the war. It's got scars from the uh, Second World War and it's retained its original colours, so it's extremely authentic. Yeah, the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, down 36 enemy aircraft in the air, destroyed 240 on the ground and uh, several thousand railway wagons and road vehicles as well. Thing because it enabled the fighters to escort the bombers to places like Berlin, um, and uh, that led to uh, comments about Hermann Goering, who said that uh, there would never be a bomb in Berlin. Of course, it was the most Gentle wing waggle for a Peter type moment in the
It's got a lot of noise around it, so when it comes in, wait for it to switch off and get out of the aircraft before you have a nice round of applause because he thoroughly deserves it.
floating there by the collection for a number of years. The Comet was actually based at Hatfield when the airfield there was uh, active, the runway here being too short at the time. When the runway was extended at Old Warden a few years ago, it meant that the aircraft could actually get in and out, taking off and landing. And when the field closed, it was empty too. So I've got a couple of quotes from uh, Dodge Bailey about uh, uh There was a very interesting series of articles in uh, our magazine. Nice wheel of landing. That's being careful with the aircraft. But what a thrill to know that you're flying the only airworthy example of one of those aircraft. Right? Something of a responsibility, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yeah. Of course, all the pilots are highly experienced and trained here and have flown all sorts of aircraft during their professional careers. But uh, this has to be the icing on the cake, I would think, for any pilot to be part of a shuttle with flying display. since the islands of Scotland, um, the easiest way to get around is by aircraft, but you need to approach the aircraft. And that's where the Dragon would be inspected and stayed until the late 1960s. Of course, in those uh, remote Scottish communities in the islands of Scotland, medical assistance or being uh, shipped into a hospital somewhere. After the airport, the airport was a visit to the FBI aircraft and the uh, BEA weapons were used for flying doctor services and air ambulance duties as well amongst the Highlands and Islands. Eventually they were replaced by, of course, the De Havilland Herons, the four-engined uh, fever airliners, but um, as John said, even as late as the 1960s, the the British European Airways were pinned. Dominies. Australia, there is a, 
a museum example. The repeat could carry six to eight passengers. In a fair degree of comfort, it has to be said. A successful but uh, they were very successful in Australia and New Zealand and they opened up Africa to their travel. So the, uh, the opportunities to enjoy spending some time here at uh, Old Warden uh, are really many and uh, varied. It's a nice atmosphere up in the, uh, the campsite. I brought my motor home for the uh, flying proms and uh, it was nice to go back there after the evening and uh, have a little glass of something before I turned in for the night. Well, quite a large glass of something as it turned out. and on the trade stands around the site uh, plenty to uh, have a browse through uh, various activities taking place as well through the afternoon like the uh, model makers from Brampton who join us for every display and uh, the use of the skies is one of these uh, tea time -like grinders the grinders just take the off the uh, collection is like the super club from 1961 representing those in the flight shape. Coming in from the right, the DeSouza monoplane, that's the one with one wing, and the DH60 Moth. Yeah. 
included um, a 24-hour flight by the chief pilot, Hubert Broad. He travelled 1,400 miles and never left the airport. I think the fact that uh, Amy Johnson took a off Jason from England to Australia is testament enough to the durability of uh, the de Havilland aircraft. If that aircraft, of course, is in the science museum, it's the reason to report. Richard Shuttleworth used his DeSouza quite extensively, uh, very often for trips across the channel, uh, bringing back various commodities, usually bottles, for his friends and colleagues. Uh, Chief Engineer John Munn returning to Earth in the DeSouza. another aeroplane and fly in sort of close formation plus like that takes a lot of concentration and later on you'll see a, an even better example of matching speeds because um, the next glider going to fly it's um, half its fastest speed it's just slow and small speed on target so there's a real balancing act there just waiting for it to cast off. There she goes. Many air cadets flew in the uh, SFA and started their flying careers, so this is uh, a, a very historic uh, air, airframe.
Wonderfully tight wing overs, loops. T21. Oh, so graceful. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. Mr. Graham Saw, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what a display. Coming in from the right. Through the ship. And these are the personal aircraft. They realised having uh, greatly modified these proctors to become, I think they were called Proctor Super or something like that, something in the day. Twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty-four miles, uh, the distance of the return flight in February of nineteen thirty-nine. I reckon that still stands as one of the greatest. Think about journey time. Henshaw did the entire thing sitting on a sawbone mat because the over 1100 of these derivatives that they began to build. So, many for the uh, war effort where they were used to or 
Australia. However, he uh, landed for refueling in Italy and ground looped his uh, aircraft, which damaged the uh, undercarriage struts and stranded him some 1,500 miles short of home. So he had to leave the aircraft. Uh, to be Just the long curving approach. This is to get around to the Spitfire, which has a similar problem. It's a fact it's sort of nicknamed the Spitfire approach. That aircraft was designed to prepare pilots for flying in modern jets, which had a low uh, spool up, or sorry, long spool up periods. Uh, so it had a very powerful engine and took a long time to respond. Eventually, it was realised that having a jet trainer, perhaps an all jet training scheme, might be the answer. And so, a jet version of the promise was developed. And this is the final uh, version of T5. 
custom is 734 Frogger's built during the production run. An Armstrong Sydney Viper turbojet um, powered the engine, giving it a top speed of about 440 miles an hour, 382 knots. Now, just a point of information for you, ladies and gentlemen, if you are sitting close to the... significance really of the promised is that it was the first uh, all jet or purpose built jet trainer for the RAF. That is Mark said it went on to be an export success and to be a light strike. Around about sort of 20, 25,000 pounds in actual fact. So not a lot of money. Um, yeah, an arm and a leg to operate with objectives. What do you think of it as being essentially a, uh, a British training aircraft? Uh, but uh, I saw one sitting in a hangar at Payne Field in Washington State. <laughs> sort of 1950s it had a, a straight leading edge later aircraft had more sweep on the wings to improve the aerodynamics at high speed I mean high speed wasn't necessarily a consideration though in the training run of uh, the, the promise First flown, having been designed and built by Gloucester in uh, 1934, it was the first RAF fighter with uh, an enclosed cockpit and uh, the last biplane fighter in service with the RAF and uh, frankly it was obsolete by the outbreak of hostilities in 1939. Lovely little breakaway there from uh, both aircraft, just three planes. In actual fact, there were more than that, just not all airworthy at the same time. Uh, but it gave rise to uh, the, uh, the myth, as it were, of Faith Hope and uh, Charity. 830 horsepower was front on the Boston Gladiator. We'll see the Gladiator again in a few minutes' time. 
However, to ride from the heart of Lake Bonner, the Dean, two seater fighter, some 304 of these built by uh, Hawker. And if you look side on at the fuselage, you can see the heritage of the Hurricane. And it highlights one particular problem which is not anticipated. At over 200 miles an hour, if you've got a gunner facing a rear and trying to maneuver the gun, then the gun itself becomes effectively a rudder for the aircraft, and therefore it changes the way the aircraft behaves. And uh, they tried various things to minimise this and make sure it's There's a close association between the motor industry and aviation, and in fact, was in fact controls to turn the rear seat round. I've got a feeling that the Gladiator is coming back onto uh, the runway. I've got a feeling you're right. So, for some reason, cutting short the display. Slaps are down, yes. Yeah. Unusual for uh, a biplane in that uh, the uh, Gladiator had flaps on both the upper and the lower wing surfaces. Well, it was the first RAF fighter to have flaps. Mm. So that's Frank Chapman safely back to Earth. Probably a bit disappointed. Um, I was with Frank earlier. He's very much looking forward to, uh, to flying the Gladiator today. Drifting in. Those interwar biplanes by Hawker, lovely looking. Yeah, it's very graceful design. Uh, and Hawker produced a, a special um, fitting for most of these metal parts, didn't it? Yeah, the box fitting on the end of the tube, which would uh, act as a width of the joints. And it sounds sort of a minor thing, but of course it was a major weight saving. Belgium designs in the actually two Belgian pilots to escape from occupied Belgium. And the UK. It was the Leon. Sort of 76 knots, 85 miles an hour, on a late summer's afternoon. Not to be seen, is that? Well, good point. If this were a wooden aircraft, they're much smoother than a metal aircraft, but this could be a, a wooden aircraft. Uh, not used very much these days uh, by modern aircraft because they're more resistant to side wing, uh, cross winds, but uh, certainly very useful in a tail dragger aircraft. On, which is the sensible option in these conditions. Keep the nose forward and let the tail drop. They are very nice. 
talk about the similarities, the differences between the, the time of the, the shop, the time of the house, the, the tail, the skin, the business, the time of the house, the years. Well, the shop was dug at the end of the war, but it was reverted back to a single seat configuration in the mid 30s. So it's very much nearly an original. And the colour scheme was very distinctive. Not only was the pump slower, but also the, the machine gun that the pump had was, it was made, it was only one gun, and the BN5 just one shot on either side of the propeller, so um, it's very quiet, particularly in there. These two aircraft are very much from the very same generation, and both very useful type aircraft. That's an inch. That's an inch. The Albatross was very much the enemy of both the, the Pup and the Newport. And, uh, so these would have, you wouldn't have seen these actually in combat because they would be far too high. They would be above the point at which you could see them. But if you were in combat, the Albatross, as I said, is a, is a 5A. Uh, it's inherited from its predecessors the V strut. And the Germans were so impressed with the aircraft in front, uh, the Newport 16, its manoeuvrability and its climb rate, and they thought they would they could adjust the 5A to something similar. The Albatross is in the colours of. The Newport uh, 16 is a home build, as already been described, um, but it's in the colours of Captain Robert Subra of the SKV Lafayette, and uh, probably most distinctive for the Indian motif on the side of the fuselage. Whereas the Newport has a Forward firing Lewis gun and the gun on the top. Sorry, the ranks of the Albatross is that they've got two forward firing uh, Spandau machine guns firing through the propeller with something like 100, sorry, 900 guns of ammunition. The other thing that they was that it was fire three bullets. David Bremner in the scout can tell you a lot more stories about the interest of the in the scout. We're re reenacting something that actually happened in uh, August 1917, uh, taking where uh, Kissenberg did actually engage in combat with uh, the Newport 17. Listen to the Mercedes Benz engine and see how it went.
this is the first opportunity since the aircraft arrived from New Zealand that we've actually displayed it uh, separately. So we're very really pleased to actually get you all here. It is a magnificent look. Trust operates the Albatross and the B2 from Stillaris, Global 1 Airfield in Texas. We're also going to have a simulator, a firefight simulator, up near the refueling point. And if you want to have a go on that, it controls the VR. Right, we have another airframe in the sky. The, uh, very distinctive Southwest Triplane. Um, the pump was spectacular more speed was needed, and better visibility. And Southwest took us on board and decided that if they kept the same wing area, then it could be by three instead of two. of British aviation early in the in the war period and even before. And Hawker was a cautious man, but he took the Sopwith triplane prototype up and on its first flight he looped it three times, uh, which shows great confidence in the design and construction. Dick Forsyth from the World War One Airport just for chatting about uh, the aircraft being displayed. Thank you very much for a very nice display, Jonathan. Sopwith triplane prototype looped on its very first flight, but when it went to France for evaluation, it flew its first mission within 15 minutes of landing. You probably went to see his friend to catch the pop. Thank you. 
already through uh, the day, the uh, Piper Super Cup there, um, the uh, Red River, the uh, SBAS uh, registration, Gold Sierra Vicky, to the States this afternoon. Stay aloft for over four hours and go up to like uh, 10 or 12,000 feet. But it's presented these days as a night fighter. And you've got that very distinctive sound, rotary engine. Stability and suitability as a, a trainer, the uh, operator of the Six Flying Circus. Um, I did a, a, a bit more of a bit. Oh, yeah.
one thing that sometimes get asked about and I have the answer. If people talk about uh, rotary engineer Conway. Scotty Butler safe and return to Earth. And also Matthew Coddington uh, visiting over at 504. And we're very grateful to Matthew because it was obviously quite a bumpy ride down from Sywell earlier today. Though the Bristol fighter 13 or one early 1914, so similar to the Avro 504 code. And uh, it really was way, way ahead of the time. Don't have a moment to speak to that, or was highly blue as well. Absolutely. Well, it's reckoned that with a, a full drum of uh, ammo, uh, a few. The planes were always able to uh, land it safely. A Lerone engine, nine cylinder, 80 horsepower rotary up front, uh, giving a top speed of about 82. German officers were taking their lady friends out for uh, lunch on a Sunday. 22 squadrons to fly over and shoot the place up, which really annoyed people. But they had range, they had power. There was another pilot who got uh, a VC uh, in his scout. For some inexplicable reason, my dentist's waiting room has got a picture, a mural of a scout. There's a new port, and how it paints at all. So, no idea why they've got them up on the murals, uh, as murals on the wall in uh, my dentist's waiting room. It beats reading country life while you've waited my life to say. Yeah. Uh, Bristol Scout was very popular and scared large count aircraft from great distances. That gave them a major advantage. 
folding the dogs for the huge ball, that's, that's available. Uh, but what it meant in the Bristol Scout was vital. The uh, Bristol fighter, by comparison, was not only favoured by aggressive pilots, people like Keith Clark, who led the 11th group in the Battle of Britain, he shot the it's about Sergeant Powell, the uh, a rear gunner. Um, there were two others, uh, basically a 22 squadron, who we were renowned for this. Um, an Italian called Tom Noel, who had 24 victories, and Sergeant Arthur Newland, who had 22. And the, the point was made in the article about it, which is Cross and Blockade, which I remember is that you needed to have very powerful shoulders to actually twist the gun into the slipstream and aim it accurately. So, a very important uh, skill to have, a very important muscles to have building. They're absolutely identical. And coming in from your right. That unmistakable sight and sound arguably. Then became an instructional airframe at Loughborough College in Leicestershire before coming to the collection here at Old Warden in 1961 to be restored to uh, flying condition. In, uh, in Canada, so uh, a frosty start, but uh, then came over to the UK and served with 801 Squadron on HMS Indomitable. Public adoration of the Spitfire, and the Spitfire overseas is a, a sexy aircraft, if you like. And in fact, it's at the coast, it was used more or less throughout the war um, in almost every theatre um, for a variety of, uh, of roles, including sticking a 75mm cannon underneath it, which must have been fun. And it shot down more enemy aircraft than uh, Allied aircraft combined, of course, so it was a force to be reckoned with as a, a gun platform. equipped to go to higher altitude. experience to sort out what was wrong with the aircraft, for instance the leaks on the burning. When you look at the uh, Hurricane side of you see the heritage from the early beginning of the uh, hearts and the path of uh, Sydney Camp's uh, design bureau. The aircraft originally looking after the uh, convoys in the latter part of the area, voyages over the front of the Collection Hurricane was also a, a bit of uh, being deemed to be as accurate as a film possibly could be. 
I always thought that Michael Caine's uh, famous quote was about playing the daughter. I reckon that if you had the right direction, um, then the, the guns would hit the target. Hurricanes also suffered uh, less downtime due to uh, fuselage and wing damage because left or right. the universal wing and this meant that it could take either cannons or machine guns or both and it was also it also enabled mass production and uh, it was the reason the 5C was produced in more numbers than any other type of uh, Spitfire and the wing was service and was very ill during the uh, final stages of development of uh, the Spitfire. Thank you. 
just a physical factor, but the psychological impact of what those young minds may have done. Only in their teens, of course, uh, mere boys, not men, although they very quickly turn into men, I'm sure. It's a wonderful book. I think it's in the bookshop here. Shaky Shakespeare returning safely to Earth after a very spirited display in the hurricane. collection pilot for many years, but that is his debut in the Spitfire. So he's uh, taxi being uh, switched off from his previous years of casting. Spitfire uh, down. The Spitfire and the Hurricane flown as always in memory of uh, the few from those dark days of uh, the Battle of Britain. We thank him and indeed all our pilots uh, for their efforts today. The engineers of the ground crews, the volunteers and so on who uh, look after the aircraft on the ground. 